forward to this computer. All right. Um, we will close that down. And again, those of you who didn't get it the first time, if you have any questions or uh, problems using Zoom, rather than use the chat box, if you would just email me at efforta1732 at gmail.com, I will be monitoring that email as well as we go through the evening. So if you have any problems technology-wise, check, get a hold of me there. If you have questions, put them in the chat box and, and I will moderate a question and answer later. Uh, at this point, I have a couple other questions we're going to answer here before we get going, sort of audience ones. So the first one is, have you ever visited Ephrata Cloister? And the second one, how did you find out about this programming so that we know how we're doing with our marketing? So if you want to take a few minutes and answer those for us, I'd be greatly appreciate it. And I'd ask if you answer other, if you could um, just type in the chat box where you did here, that would be great. I appreciate that. And we pretty much have everybody in. Looks like 73% of the people have actually, 29 of you have been to the Effort of Cloister. And most of you seem to have found out about it on our Facebook page. So thank you very much for following us on the Facebook page. <clears throat> and then 30% um, uh, friend or colleague. So thanks, thanks to those friends and colleagues that, that sent you our way. We appreciate that. All right. And with that, I'm going to end the poll. And I am going to close that off. And at this point, I'm going to introduce our speaker for tonight, who is Nick Seeger. Um, while Nick's official title is uh, Guide Supervisor, he is an effort of scholar as well. He keeps us on an even keel, providing visitor services. And then um, in his spare time, not that there's a lot of that, he does an amazing amount of research. So I hope you enjoy tonight's presentation on the sacred geometry of Ephrata Cloister. And I will turn this over to Nick now. And Nick, I'm just going to turn it over to you and mute myself. Okay. All right. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, if you have uh, problems hearing me or anything, if you can just uh, send a comment to Elizabeth. If you have any questions at all, please, uh, Elizabeth will see your questions and we can answer them later on. Or if it's something that uh, really pressing, I said that she should feel free to break right in. Uh, but I want to welcome you here for the Zoom presentation of the uh, of Sacred Geometry of Ephrata. Uh, some of you are affiliated, some of you know something about Ephrata, some of you don't. Uh, so I, some of this will be new, some of it will be a little bit old, but uh, I might go back and forth a little bit to sort of uh, include everyone in. Uh, I want to start by, first of all, giving credit where credit is due. A lot of the research, most of the research, most of the work for this presentation was already done and it comes from the very best book on Africa, which is this book right here, which is uh, Voices of the Turtle Doves, which is by Dr. Jeff Bach from Elizabethtown College. He's a religious studies professor, a specialist on the Brethren Church. He's also the director of the Young Center for Anabaptist and Pietist Studies. It's the best book on the place, and he's a great friend of ours, a colleague, a great friend, and uh, so we thank him for this. So, uh, Sacred Geometry of Africa. Okay, well, start with a look at a little piece of the Ephrata Cloister, a little picture of the Ephrata Cloister. The Ephrata Cloister is a religious community, it was a religious community, set along the, the banks of the Cocalico Creek, now Ephrata, in 1732. It does not exist anymore. Uh, it's settled by a German separatist named, named Conrad Beisel. And, um, and it, 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 some people just are very confused about the Ephrata Cloister. You could say they're a sect, they're a religious sect, a very small religious group. It doesn't exist anymore. There was only one of these people. Or is there, were, there were shakers everywhere, uh, Moravians all over the place. Uh, there was only one group of these people, and uh, they don't exist anymore. Uh, settled in 1732. They reached their height in 1750. 
In 1750, there were 300 members at Ephrata, at the Community of Ephrata, it's called. Today we call it the Ephrata Cloister. It was called the Community of Ephrata. It gets the name Cloister a little bit later. 300 members, 40 celibate men, 40 celibate women, and 220 married members that were known as householders. They lived on farms surrounding the settlement and in the community, and they helped support these people. It's kind of a, a Protestant monastic community, in other words, almost like a, um, a convent and a monastery put together. Um, they were known for their art, for their music, for their architecture, for their printing, for their beautiful music, and uh, they, were a, a, they were a milling center. Uh, eventually, the community declines, it dies out, and today, the buildings are preserved by the Pennsylvania Historic and Museum Commission. It's a state museum, and it's preserved for education and for study, and just to come and walk around. It's a beautiful place. If you haven't been there, please visit it. Hopefully, this will whet your appetite for this. You're looking at two of the most of the surviving uh, nine structures there. Two of the most important, the one on the left, and I'm going to use my little um, mouse there, um, pointed out that one on the left is the Sarin. It's a four-story structure built in 1743. It was built for uh, celibate men. It was built for married members that were going to become celibate members. That was Conrad Weiss's hope. Eventually, it becomes a home for the celibate sisters. Next to it is their meeting house. It was called the Zoll. It's a four-and-a-half-story structure and very unusual structure. And it's my understanding these two buildings were the largest buildings built west of Philadelphia before the American Revolutionary War. So very impressive structures for the day. And if you come to the Ephrata Cloister, you'll get a tour on the, uh, on the first floor of both of those buildings. So it's a fascinating place. Um, the buildings at the Ephrata Cloister do not appear to be, have been constructed with a master plan in mind. But Conrad Beisel and his followers, both celibate and possibly married members, organized some of their space and time around Beisel's mystical language and beliefs. So it's not a specific plan, but there appears to be a theme. In design and in placement, these structures created a sacred or holy space whose placement and design possibly had symbolic significance. Now to examine the, this issue of sacred space and, and sacred geometry, I'm gonna focus on one building in effort a, 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 in particular, and I'm gonna talk, I'm also gonna focus on a very significant book, that was here at the time and may have had an influence. Now, much of the beliefs and theology of Ephrata and its founder, Conrad Weissel, comes from what was called radical German pietism and this man, Jakob Burma, uh, the influence of this German mystic, philosopher, theologian, and theosophist, Jakob Burma, and, uh, and others that followed in his footsteps. Uh, Jakob Burma was a radical and original thinker he comes out of the German Lutheran tradition, but then he has his own enlightened mystical experience, which inform all of his writings. He wrote very profusely, a uh, very influential writer in, in, in religion, in philosophy. He's extremely influential to other thinkers, mainly German thinkers, um, and even German philosophers like Hegel and Schopenhauer. Uh, he also influenced many anti-authoritarian mystical movements such as radical pietism, including Conrad Beisel and the, the founder of the Ephrata community. Also someone uh, known named Johann Kelpius, uh, also the Harmony Society, also the Rosicrucians, a group called the Philadelphians, and also the Moravians. So very, very influential. Now in Voices of the Turtle Doves, which is the best book on Ephrata, uh, Jeff Bach talks about um, radical pietism as sort of like a pot of simmering soup. And he says that uh, many members of this, of this group, uh, different me members, flavored this pot of simmering soup with different ingredients. And um, so I'm going to just talk about some of the ingredients that are, that are in radical pietism and may have been in effort as well. One of those ingredients was alchemy, uh, both spiritual and physical. Um, the idea, a lot of people think of alchemy as turning a base metal into a higher metal, like turning to turning uh, lead into gold. But there's also a spiritual aspect, the idea of spiritual rejuvenation, uh, the rejuvenation of the spirit from a base level to a higher or purer level. There's a big element of that in alchemy and at Ephrata. Uh, we also have elements of astrology at Ephrata as well too, very practical and, and spiritual. I mean, um, astrology was a big part of life, it still is today, but it was a much bigger part of life back then. There was a practical aspect, I mean, how, how to figure out how to, 
when to plow, when to plant. Well, look at the Farmer's Almanac. And uh, what better way to find out the, the, the creator's intent than by looking at his celestial creation, so astrology. Uh, also elements of numerology, uh, the study of numbers and the belief in a divine or mystical relationship between numbers and events here on Earth and in the cosmos. Also, geomancy or sacred geometry. Sacred geometry involves the use of sacred universal patterns in the design of everything in our reality, not only in nature, but also most often seen in sacred architecture and sacred art. But it also sometimes in, is in non-religious structures. A lot of people say that Washington, D.C., and the way it is laid out has certain symbolic significance. So there's elements of that. And the idea of geomancy, which is the art of placing, arranging buildings, in, on other sites auspiciously. And of course, uh, it, has, it has its corollary in other, in, in other countries as well. I think of Feng Shui, is a, or the, the Chinese art of placement. That's very similar to geomancy, which is more European. Um, folk magic. Um, uh, every culture has its, has its own type of folk magic. Uh, in, in, in Haiti, it's voodoo. In, um, in, in New Orleans, I mean, in Santeria, uh, and in the Pennsylvania Germans, they have powwowing, or brotherai is what it is. It's kind of like a German faith healing, it mixes a religion with elements of magic. Every culture has it. It was here at Ephrata too. Christian mysticism, this, um, this attempt to develop a language and describe the experience of existing in the presence of God or the divine. There's also elements of uh, Christian uh, Kabbalah. This is a Christian reading of Jewish Kabbalah. And Jewish Kabbalah is uh, Jewish mysticism. Starts in the 11th, 12th century, and it's kind of like a mystical Jewish reading of the Hebrew Bible. And during the Renaissance, it gets kind of adopted by Christianity, and it gets used to, to read the New Testament as well. And basically to, to find out how the Old Testament backs up the New Testament, sort of thing like that. So Christian Kabbalah, Christian reading of Kabbalah. And some would even say that Ephrata, there was also elements of what they would call Rosicrucianism. Rosicrucianism is a very broad term. There's many different types of, of Rosicrucian groups. Um, uh, basically, in a nutshell, it's something that starts about the 1600s. It's kind of a secret society, although some say it has much older beginnings. Um, and it's a mixture of many di different disciplines and beliefs, Christianity, alchemy, science, and it's basically based around a complete rejuvenation of society. Uh, and that's a very broad, very broad, but that's just the general uh, definition. Now, from the 17th to the 19th century, various groups and individuals under the general heading of radical pietism flavored their particular brand of radical pietism with different amounts of these ingredients. While some writings exist that give a good idea of the religious themes and beliefs at Ephrata, no concise systematic record of Ephrata's creed was ever recorded. So no one at Ephrata, at Conrad Bison the Fountain, didn't write down a book and say, this is what we believe. We have to extrapolate it after his, out of his letters, out of what people said about Ephrata, out of, out of the voluminous writings and the music we have. We have to extract those different nights and sort of figure it out then. So um, not everyone at Ephrata shared the exact same beliefs. Um, or were they consistent across the board? So these different elements of these different disciplines I'm talking about, they maybe feel it knew more about them and less about them. Uh, but it all goes into flavoring this, this group that is Ephrata. And so it's one of the things we're still figuring out, really. Okay. Now, the, the view of Ephrata at the time, the worldview of Ephrata at the time, Ephrata comes from a time when there is less separation between what we would consider religious beliefs and those beliefs which today we review as like esoteric or magical or, or mystical or like new age. In other words, in the 16 and 1700s, there were fewer barriers between things like alchemy and chemistry and be, be, between out, um, astronomy and, and astrology. They're, they're a little bit closer together. So you might have a king, you know, in Europe, you've got kings and they've got priests and ministers and they have a chapel, but they also hire an astrologer. They might hire a numerologist to kind of define the future for them, see what's going on there. And there's sort of a, and that was kind of accepted. Even Martin Luther, founder of uh, Lutheranism, he said that alchemy was not heretical, her, uh, that alchemy basically but backed up scripture. So these things were kind of, you know, were accepted. They were looked at as sort of on the outside, but they were still accepted. But as Ephrata is emerging, uh, and basically what you'd have in the Enlightenment, being the 1700s, 1800s, 
well, 1600s, 1700s, you begin to see a separation, a uh, separation from like science and religion, and you start to see a separation, almost like not it's an agreed upon thing, but they're they're staking out their their territory, and what gets thrown in the middle and what gets forgotten are those sort of more esoteric things like astrology and alchemy. They get kind of pushed to the back and marginalized. They're still there, but they're marginalized. But as all this is going on, that produces in its own kind of little bubble. So this is sort of the thing. And there are some historians that even think that, and even say that that, 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 that man, and I don't, I don't mean man, just men, just you know, man, mankind in the 1600s and 1500s actually had a different kind of relationship with the world. It was more kind of holistic. Uh, it was more kind of an acceptance of these of these different things, even though if they didn't talk about them, they accepted they were real. And there's just a little quote that I'd like to read uh, that really captures this very nicely. And it's from a man named Owen Barfield. And Owen Barfield was a philosopher of English language. Uh, he was also one of the Inklings, one of the people that hung around with, in Oxford with C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. They hung around together and they talked and they discussed uh, religion and philosophy and mysticism. And, and, uh, and Owen Barfield wrote this really interesting, he didn't write, know anything about Ephrata, but he's writing about medieval men at the time. And he's writing about, uh, in this book called Saving the Appearance, and he writes about what medieval men looked at when he looked at the world. So if you could just, you know, uh, it indulge me here. So uh, he asks us to place ourselves inside the skin of the medieval man in the street. If we look at the sky, we do not see it as an empty space. If it is daytime, we see the air filled with light proceeding from a living sun, rather as our own flesh is filled with blood proceeding from a living heart. If it is nighttime, we do not nearly see a plain homogeneous vault pricked with separate points of light, but a regional qualitative sky from which, first of all, the great sections of the great zodiacal belt, and secondly, the planets and the moon, each of which is embedded in its own revolving crystal sphere, are raining down their complex influences upon the earth. We take it for granted that those invisible spheres are giving forth an inaudible music. We know for very well that growing things are specially beholden to the moon, that gold and silver draw their virtue from the sun and the moon respectfully, copper from Venus, iron from Mars, lead from Saturn, and that our own health and temperament are joined by invisible threads to these heavenly bodies we are looking at. We probably do not spend any time thinking about these extrasensory links between ourselves and the phenomena. We merely take them for granted. So people don't walk around thinking about, oh, we're, we're connected to the cosmos, but you just, you just took it for granted that all these things were going on. So, so that sets up my presentation. In the winter of 1740 to 1741, workers began constructing a half-timbered meeting house of four and a half stories for the householders. Today, it is known as the Zoll, or German for Hall, but Beisel named it Panel. The name Panel comes from the Old Testament in Genesis 32. In Genesis 32, Jacob gave the name Panel to the place where he wrestles with an angel or representative of God, and he will not let this being go until he receives a blessing. In a 1741 letter, Beisel described the biblical story as a metaphor for the renunciation of all things and a wrestling with God for a blessing. But for Beisel, it had another meaning as well. In the story, while they are wrestling, and this is in scripture, while they are wrestling, this angel or being touches Jacob's thigh, and it puts his hip out of joint. This is one of the reasons why, um, why Jewish people don't eat a certain part of the joint of, of, of the meat. Uh, in, in, in Orthodox Jewish people don't eat a certain piece of meat that has this, this, this joint. It kind of goes back to that. But for Beisel, Jacob's disjointed hip represents celibacy or spiritual castration to banish lust and male domination. So this probably comes, this writing Beisel talks about, probably comes from Beisel's reading of Jakob Burma and another big influence on effort, a man named Johann Gechtel. Um, for Beisel, Pennell referred to the struggle to overcome sexual desire and the desire for material possessions. 
panel was to serve as the spiritual battleground where the householders advanced toward a fuller monastic life and emerged as successful celibate members. So those two buildings I showed you, they were kind of like social experiments where married members were gonna come in and become successful celibate members. It doesn't work that way. The, the married members end up going back to their farms and homes and the true celibate sisters that wanna be celibate, they take that building over and the true brothers, the true celibate brothers take over, you know, build another structure. But that's Beisel's intent. So let's take a look. So the story surrounding Pennell is significant, but the actual design of this building may contain sacred geometrical principles. So let's take a look at the Zoll. There's the Zoll right there. The Zoll, or Pennell, as, as Conrad Beisel originally called it, uh, measures 40 feet across the front, 37 feet from the front to the back, and 47 feet high. It's nearly a perfect cube. Now the cube was recognized as a sign of perfection in alchemy. The cube is also the geometric signature of salt. Uh, and salt is a very important element in alchemy and the book we're going to be talking about. For Jakob Burma, 40 is also a very important number. And there is a great deal of numerical symbolism in Burma's work. There's also a lot of the appearance of 40s, uh, numerology, the use of 40 in the Bible as well. 40 represents the number of days of testing that Adam endured in paradise. Moses remained on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. God declared that the children of Israel shall wander 40 years in the wilderness. And Jesus spent 40 year, days in the desert, and the number 40 shows up in a number of times in the Bible. According to Jeff Bach, who wrote Voices of the Turtle Doves, Beisel believed that all of these things related to the inner testing that believers faced. Is it possible that the householders were being tested in the Zal and that this was their testing place? This nearly 40-foot cube could have symbolized the testing of the married householders to see if they would remain with their earthly mates or desire their proper heavenly mate, Christ, Sophia, in, in, and rise to a higher level. Now, some of you that are not familiar with Ephrata may not even be familiar with this term, Christ, Sophia. Uh, so I think I need to just touch on that a little bit. Um, and a lot of this philosophy that Conrad Beisel, actually, the idea of Sophia it's, it's, it's very, very old. It's actually pre-Christianity. But a lot of what these people, what Conrad Weiss is talking about, it comes from the philosophy of Jakob Burma. According to Burma, Sophia is the female aspect of God. Um, God is singular and perfect in every way and doesn't need a mate, but he has Sophia inside of him. Uh, that, is, that is a belief of, of Jakob Burma. Uh, uh, the idea of Sophia as the female aspect of God is also extrapolated from the Bible, from the wisdom literature and Proverbs, and in two books of the Apocrypha, and also in the wisdom of Solomon. It implies that, and if you do read it in scripture, especially the book of Solomon, it kind of implies that, that wisdom, uh, and, the, and the Greek word for wisdom is, is Sophia, uh, that wisdom is female, kind of says if you want to be with her, if you want to follow her, it kind of implies that wisdom is female. So Sophia cannot be found by name in the Bible, but she, she's extrapolated in the Bible, uh, from the Bible. And she's also in early Christianity, uh, when the Roman Empire uh, makes uh, Christianity the legitimate religion of the Roman Empire, he actually dedicates a huge uh, cathedral to Sophia, it's called Hagia Sophia, uh, it's in Constantinople. Uh, it gets taken over by the church, turns into a mosque, but it's still there. It has uh, all these wonderful mosaics of Sophia in there. And then gradually Sophia kind of gets, I guess, marginalized. And, you know, some people, some scholars say she kind of turns up in the, in the, uh, in the Trinity. You know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. She's kind of the Holy Ghost. Um, okay. Now, according to Burma, um, according to Burma, in Genesis, God decides to create a perfect example of his work, and he creates Adam. Uh, Adam is perfect and complete in every way. But uh, 
a lot of this reading comes from Burma and also Burma's reading of what we would call Kabbalah and Christian Kabbalah. The idea that, um, that Adam is, is just like God in a way, he's perfect in every way, kind of like God. And uh, in fact, uh, in, in Burma says that, um, Burma says that Adam um, also has Sophia inside of him as his heavenly mate. And according to Burma, Adam, like God, does not need to eat. He has no organs of uh, digestion, elimination, or reproduction. He's kind of like just kind of like an androgynous, you know, kind of a, a model, an ideal. Uh, he doesn't any reproduction uh, method, and he gets his nourishment from the fruits of the Garden of, of, of Eden, the Garden of Eden, uh, paradisally. And I don't know what that what that means or what that looks like, but I guess he just absorbs it. Um, one of Adam's jobs or duties in the Garden of Eden is giving the animals names, ordering the animals. It says that in Scripture. While Adam is giving the animals names, he discovers that the animals are separated by the sexes, and Adam decides that he also wants a mate. And according to Burma, this is the first fall. And according to, according to Yaka Burma, there are two falls. The first fall is in not, not, um, not taking in the fruit, the evil fruit. It's actual his desire for a mate. That is his first fall. Now, when God created Adam, created Adam, he also gave him free will. And Adam, uh, now Adam didn't really need a mate. He already had Sophia, but uh, he already had Sophia inside of him, but he used his own free will to go against will to do as he wished. And God did give him will so he could use it. So God says, all right, he puts Adam to sleep. You want a mate? All right. He puts Adam to sleep, into a deep sleep, and he withdraws from Adam one of his ribs. And according to Burma, um, the half cross T, if you look at the top of the uh, skull, the cranium, it looks like kind of like a T that comes together when the skull comes together when, when the child grows up. Uh, the half cross T. And with it, he creates woman, Eve, as Adam's mate. But when God opens Adam's side to remove one of his ribs, Sophia, in a rage because of Adam's spiritual uh, adultery, uh, departs from Adam. And this results in a separation and an imbalance of the sexes. So all of this, all of this, the idea of celibacy, there's num many different reasons people will give for it. One is to, you know, to concentrate on your religious practice, and also because Christ is returning, and we're going to heaven, they, people believe in the return of Christ. But also the idea that this is to go back to God's original intent in the Garden of Eden, where men and women weren't meant to be the way we reproduce today. That wasn't God's intent. So celibacy at effort it was an attempt by Conrad Beisel to set things right and return to God's original intention. According to Beisel, man and woman could produce children, um, but they were to be spiritual children um, in heaven, not here on earth. Okay, so that, that's why men and women are separate at Ephraim. And this is supported, according to Burma, by what happens next in the Garden of Eden. Because when God creates Eve, he doesn't just set them loose in the Garden of Eden and, and, and tell them to go reproduce. Um, when God says be fruitful and multiply, he's not, Burma says he's not talking about humans, he's talking about plants and animals. Not Adam and Eve, they have spiritual paradisial bodies. They can't reproduce. But God, and God makes it quite clear that Adam and Eve are to remain in the Garden of Eden and all the fruits, animals, and plants are for their use. They're for them. But what can they not do? Well, everyone knows what they're not supposed to do. They're not supposed to partake of the fruit of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if they do, they will die. That's what it says in Scripture. If you eat that, you're going to die. Well, of course, we know what happens next. The serpent comes down, tempts Eve, says you're not going to die. You're going to learn, maybe even become greater than God. So Eve tempts um, uh, Adam. Adam bites into the apple, and of course, that's the second fall. So it's interesting, uh, Yaka Burma gives good blame to Adam as well. It isn't just Eol Eve's fault, it's Adam's fault too. In fact, maybe even a little more Adam's fault. And what happens after they eat from that apple? They realize their nakedness, they realize their lust, they have to make clothing out of leaves, and God expels them from the Garden of Eden, expels them, kicks them out. No more Garden of Eden. And when they leave, they are punished. And what is their punishment? Adam's punishment, he has to work. He has to sow the field. The snake has to crawl in those belly. And Eve, she gets punished too. One punishment is she has to listen to Adam. She has to be subservient to Adam, and that's how that starts. And the next thing is she has to suffer in childbirth. That's her penalty. So this whole thing, 
you know, ha having children the way we think is normally in this wonderful thing, it's God's mistake. It's a mistake. And so Conrad Weissel is trying to put it all back. And that's what, you know, and, and Jakob Burma says, that's a very interesting thing. And I know I sort of go off a tangent a little bit, but that's why the celibus is going on there. Now, Jakob Burma's thought and other alchemical and Christian Kabbalistic traditions helped to shape the thought of a little known writer named Jörg von Welling. Jörg von, von Welling wrote a very influential book, and that book was called Opus Mago Kabbalisticum et Theosophicum. That's the short title. The longer title is um, uh, Ma uh, Opus Mago Kabbalisticum et Theosophicum, in which the original, the origin, nature, characteristics, and use of salt, sulfur, and mercury are described in three parts together with much wonderful mathematical, theosophical, magical, and mystical material, as well as thoughts on the creation of metals and minerals in nature, many curious mago Kabbalistic illustrations, and a key to the entire work. It actually goes a little further. <laughs> it's a long title. Um, and, and this book is in our collection here at the Effort of Cloister. It was brought here by Effort of Members. It was owned by Sebastian Keller. And if you look right underneath the title, underneath Jörg, uh, that word opus there, you see my little mouse, either side, Sebastian, and the other side, Keller. Sebastian Keller, he was a member at Effort of he was actually a married member of the community. But when he first came here, he lived as a celibate brother with other celibate brothers. And um, he was a roommate of one of the members here that was a really interesting person. He was a roommate of a man named Ezekiel Sangmeister. Ezekiel Sangmeister is a very important member of the effort of community. He was an early member, a real follower of Faisal, but then he becomes disillusioned and leaves, ends up coming back later on in life, but he writes a, a very scathing uh, autobiography, somewhat a controversial autobiography. There was some debate whether it was even a real autobiography. Uh, there seems to be some debate about that. Uh, I believe it's a real autobiography, and it was printed after his, uh, his death. And uh, he writes about a few things about Sebastian Keller. He says that according to the autobiography, he says that Keller, uh, that Sebastian Keller was a Freemason who owned a copy of the Keys of Solomon, a medieval book of divination and magic. According to Sangmeister, Keller also practiced augury and divination. And augury is a form of divination uh, re regarding omens, kind of like fortune telling and magic. The autobiography also seems to imply that Keller and others were involved in some kind of metallurgy uh, or search for precious ores or metals down in Virginia. And also that he was kind of an amateur doctor of sorts. And this is another one of my interests. There seems to be some kind of connection between metallurgy, working with metals, alchemy, you know, turning base metals to higher metals, um, uh, doctoring and, and, and doctoring and the chemicals that are used in doctoring and and uh, counterfeiting. Uh, there seems to be some kind of connection, and it's one of my interests. And I, and I want to know if there's a connection effort. Uh, so interesting person. Uh, this also gives you an idea of the wide diversity of individuals and ideas at Ephrata. Now, I'm not saying that people at Ephrata are practicing these things, but there are were people there that were interested in these things. All right. So just because there's one person that's practicing it or interest doesn't mean they all are. And it doesn't even know, I don't know if Conrad Weiss is practicing it later or not. But there are these people there. It's a very interesting mix of people. Um, now this book, uh, Opus Mago Kabbalisticum et Theosophicum, it's a very strange and difficult book to read. It was translated into English in 2006, it's about 600 pages, and I got through most of it. Uh, it gets, gets better after 150 pages, but it's really dense stuff. Uh, maybe a little bit over my head. Uh, it's kind of like a textbook. It's kind of like a textbook. It uses alchemy, Christian Kabbalah, astrology, and heavy Burma influences to explain the workings of God in the universe. It contains many Christian Kabbalistic and Burma symbols and theology, a lot of arcane symbolism. Uh, this is also at a time when, in mid beginning of the 1700s, you really don't see people burned the stake anymore for being heretics, but you could get in trouble by speaking out against the church. And these are things that are 
what he's trying to do is he's trying to walk a fine line between religion and and things like alchemy and Kabbalah and Christian Kabbalah and things like that because they were looked at as worthy of study but also a little bit dangerous. So anybody that dealt in these areas had to kind of walk a fine line. I mean, you're not going to get burned to the stake anymore, but you could uh, get ostracized. You could get in a lot of trouble. Could be put in prison. Could could be executed. Okay, so. Um, let me just show you a few of the saw slides of this book, just give you a flavor for it. Uh, it's a really, really interesting book. A lot of old script with a lot of these little symbols. If you can see my mouse there, the symbol for, um, there's the symbol for salt, there's the symbol for, um, uh, there's fire, there's water, little triangles with different things in them. Uh, these are all symbols. These are all different symbols. Uh, a lot of astrological symbols. You know, there's a lot of astrology in this book, numerology in this book. Um, a lot of these different kind of arcane symbols uh, that you're going to see the, the, the cube a lot. You're going to see the cube a lot. You're also going to see the Star of David in a circle with a, a equilateral cross upon it, all these other symbols, really interesting uh, things like this, these different uh, astrological symbols. The Ungrun, the Ungrun, the word up there, the Ungrun, that's sort of the dark, unknowable, unfathomable depths from which God emerges. In uh, Yaka Burma, God is not eternal. He's actually born. In fact, he's born many times. And uh, if, you, if, if you can sit through this presentation, maybe I'll do a presentation on, on Yaka Burma as well. So uh, it's, just, it's just really fascinating. Uh, these uh, little circles up here, these are the three worlds. There's, there's three worlds. Uh, all of existence is made up of three worlds. Um, one world is the, the world of God's love and light. The other one is the world of God's wrath. And the other one is the middle world, the outer world, the world we live in, which is a mixture of both. It has good, it has bad, it has the devil, it has demons, it has angels, it has all, the good, all that stuff. So all these really interesting things. Uh, this one here I showed at the very beginning as I was reading that little talk. This is the microcosm and the macrocosm. You see man in the middle, and you see the different zodiacal symbols around it, as well as the symbols for earth, air, fire, water, all these things interact. Okay, so it's kind of really, really interesting. Uh, this nice cube there. This one says, if you look at there, across there, it says, Das Neue Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem. Uh, that's actually referring to... Revelations, this battle in Revelations, and at the end of it is going to become like a new Jerusalem. Um, all right, and uh, there's a couple little pieces of paper in this. Now, uh, our curator Carrie Moan helped me photograph a lot of this, and uh, and he pointed out some of these little pieces of paper that were just floating in it. And this, these are like little crib notes, is what they are. Sebastian Keller's trying to learn this and he learned these symbols, and so he makes himself some little notations so he can remember. Uh, there's a couple little notations over there on that side, and then down below there's a couple other notations. Uh, what do these things mean? Well, the first one means sulfur. That's a symbol for sulfur. And then you got the four elements, fire, you got air, you got water, and you have earth. Below it is the symbol for salt. Salt is a very important element. We're going to talk a lot about salt. And the next one, I thought it might be gold, but I'm not really sure. And I really couldn't get a good definition. So I just put a question mark there because I'm not exactly sure what that is. Uh, okay, so um, go back to the book here. So to me, this book, like I was saying, it's an attempt to reconcile alchemy and other esoteric philosophies with biblical principles. There's actually a couple copies. of. We only have one copy there, but there was a couple copies of this uh, book at Ephrata. Uh, there's someone else named... Um, Jacob Martin, who, taught, who quotes the book. Uh, throughout the book, Welling offers numerous philosophical interpretations of biblical verses in the light of alchemical concepts. Uh, and Welling wasn't the first to do this, but he does it a lot throughout this. Uh, you know, and originally, alchemy concerns itself with transmutation of metals and substances, like into gold, from, you know, for, uh, for, uh, you know, other metals and other substances. But in this book, it takes on more of a spiritual aspect. This idea of the rejuvenation of the spirit from a base level to a higher spiritual level. So you're kind of using alchemy in your soul to go to a higher level. Uh, alchemy is actually the beginning of conventional chemistry. Uh, and in this book, alchemy takes on a more the theological, biblical, and spiritual aspect. You know, if you just think about it, like he's kind of making God like the ultimate alchemist. 
And, 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 and if you think about it, it's not too far-fetched because God separates light from darkness. God s- separates, oops, uh, God separates earth from water. God separates man from woman. God separates evil from goodness. So this idea of God is the ultimate alchemist. Now, this book was printed in a couple different parts. The first part, part was printed in 1735 by naming Christoph Schultz. Christoph Schultz. And Christoph Schultz, um, he, actually, um, he actually had a connection with the effort of people. Apparently, the effort of people knew about him, and he knew about them. He, he has published a number of different books, and in one book, he publishes some effort of songs. And apparently, the people at Ephraim knew about him as well. So um, from this, a lot of people will say there's a connection between other people that followed this book. This book is very, um, uh, this book is very influential in, in Rosicrucianism as well. And so a lot of people that follow Rosicrucianism will say there's a connection between Ephraim and Rosicrucianism. And, and you, know, you might be able to make that connection because they're using a lot of the same vocabulary. But we just... We just don't see evidence of an effort. We just don't see it in the writing. Uh, we just don't see it in the music. And, uh, you know, if it was there, it'd be great to see. Uh, and maybe it is there somewhere, but I just haven't seen it yet. So, uh, but I can see why people would make this connection. Um, okay. The book consists of three main parts. It's assigned to the three principles of creation. And, of course, the three principles crea- of creation are salt, Sulfur and mercury. Don't forget that now. Those are the three principles for creation. And these, pre, pre, these three principles of creation correspond and interact with the four primary elements. And of course, the four primary elements are fire, water, earth, and air. And those are the symbols for fire, water, earth, and air below. Now, the first book, part of the book is about salt and its properties. And this probably had the biggest influence on Ephrata. Welling's cosmology very much influenced Burma, and some of the diagrams in this book may have influenced the design and construction of the Pinnell, today's Zal. Uh, Welling talks a lot about salt. Welling believed that salt is the divine or primary essence. As I said earlier, the geometric signature outwards characteristic of salt is a cube. Follow me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get there. Just follow me. Welling also believed that the earth, although proved to be round, is in its essential characteristics cubic. Thus, the true virginal figure of the earth is cubic. And this is one of the, one of the diagrams from the drawing. A cube has six sides. A cube has six sides, where six sides, representing the six days of creation. Thus, the cube is a sign of perfection, which exclaims the whole of creation. A cube, a cube can also be divided into 12 bodies. If you put a line through the middle of the cube, you get two surfaces, so you can get two triangles, and I always have it in the first two sides, but you get the idea. Uh, six sides, 12 triangles, 12 bodies. Notice the line. Um, um, now, there is a point at the certain, per, certain perfect center of the cube, and this point is known as the holy point of rest. Uh, So we have six sides representing the six days of creation, and the center point, uh, the center point is the Sabbath, the day of rest, uh, the Holy Sabbath. And and, and of course, at Ephrata, they also practice worship on Saturday, the Sabbath, not Sunday. Uh, Now let's go back to this, 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 this salt cube. Here's another, here's another one that shows this very nicely. Uh, this shows this cube with a center point, and it's called the New Jerusalem. And uh, this has to do with this, uh, this battle in Revelations. Uh, we also have a, uh, uh, we have a couple things, a couple of wall charts that sort of talk about the, the, the Holy Jerusalem. It's kind of like a, a labyrinth, and the, the New Jerusalem is in the center. So this must have had an influence on, possibly had an influence on Bizel. Now, let's go back to this salt, this, this transparency. I'm going to get to the buildings in just a minute. The cube is also made up of six pyramids. If you look at that, you can make six pyramids. Forming six days of work with the Sabbath as the center point right there in the middle. According to Welling, the six pyramids in the cube symbolize the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, these 12 triangles 
have another special significance, and you see them better outlined in this diagram here. You see all the different triangles there. These 12 parts of the cube symbolize the 12 foundational pillars of the true and visible church. In other words, the 12 apostles in the New Testament. That's what that stands for. Multiply the 12 triangles by six sides, and you get the number 72, the mystical number 72. Uh, according to Jakob Burma, 72 is a very special number, a very holy number. Seven, 72 is also the 24 original elders of the church times three. So there's all this numerology going into this. And of course, um, and by 24 elders of the church, I mean the, the, uh, the 12 apostles. Uh, by by, by uh, 24 elders, I mean the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes of Israel. That's how you get the 24. Now, some of this symbolism, some of this symbolism may be present in the Zal. Its dimensions create nearly a perfect cube. Now, let's look inside the building, and let's see if some of these geometrical principles can be applied to this structure. All right, so let's do that. Okay, so this is a floor plan of the Zal. But for those of you that have been to the effort of Cloister, it's not the floor plan that many of you will recognize, because this is the Zal before the kitchen was added in 1770. There's the front door. You come in, you see the three pillars. You go to the back wall. There's a wall. There's a uh, pulpit table with a, a, it could be a martyr's mirror or a Bible. And there's a doorway that goes through into this other area, and then the kitchen. But, in, but before 1770, kitchen doesn't exist. This is an outline of that building before then. Uh, the kitchen is built two years after Conrad Weiss's death as the communities change it. So this is a diagram of the building before the kitchen was added. Today, we see the three pillars in the Zal, the large center pillar and these two small pillars that go up through the balcony, up through the, the ceiling. But actually, and many of you know this if you've been to the Ephrata Cloister, associated with Ephrata Cloister, many of you not, there's actually another pillar. There's another pillar in the Zal but it's hidden. It's behind the wall with the wall chart and the pulpit bench. It's behind. You don't see it, but it was there. Now, I want to show you something else here. This is a diorama, a model, and it was done in the 1950s, and it's a model of what the Brothers House used to look like. The Brothers House doesn't exist anymore. It's built in 1746. It's gone. Time for now to 1908. But this was a model based on the first-hand account of a man named, um, named uh, Israel Acralius. Israel Acralius visited, he was a Lutheran minister, he visited the Ephrata Cloister in the 1750s, and he went to the brother's house, and he says that the brother's house and the sister's house were, were, were just the same. Now, we know now there are some difficulties with this. Uh, we've done great archaeology on the site, and they've done archaeology at the brother's house. The brother's house does not have this large central pillar like the sister's house does. But I like this diorama because it shows this back. See the person giving the, uh, the, the little speech there? Behind him, there's this curtained area with another pillar. Now let me show you a picture of the Zal today, a couple pictures of the Zal today. So there's the Zal today. And if you walk in the front door of the Zal, you're looking in from the front in, and this one right up here on the one on the right-hand side, you see the pulpit bench, you see the doorway, behind there, there's a pillar. And if you walk through this door, and you turn around and you look at the wall, there's a glass pane that shows the actual pillar. It looks like this little one there. So there was another pillar there. You just don't see it. Okay. Um, there's also some evidence that the open area behind the eastern wall of the Zal, where the hidden, hidden pillar is, were originally divided into three chambers. There's some evidence of that. Um, Israel Acralius, the Swedish Lutheran minister that visited Effort in the 1753, was told by the brothers that this curtained area uh, in the brother's house was a sanctuary from only which Bible could enter. So we'll only go back. So, so, um, so this is what it used to look like, apparently. Now, this little illustration here, this is uh, from the Von Welling book. It was in the book there. Um, the Star of David in a circle with an imposed equilateral cross is an important symbol for Welling. 
Now, if we take this symbol right here, if we take the symbol right here and we impose it on the diagram of the Zoll, we're going to see some interesting things. So we're going to take this diagram, make it a little bigger, and we're going to put it onto the Zoll. And we're going to see kind of what we see there. We're going to see what we can. In this building, it's, it's built like a cube. It looks very much like a cube. Now, this is historic speculation. You know, it's based on Jeff Fox's work. So I'm not saying this is what it is. I'm saying it's a possibility. So let's take this, um, take this figure, and let's put this, or did Star David on there, and we're going to see some interesting things. You see how the Star of David uh, creates the points for the four vertical pillars? You see the pillars right in there, the four vertical pillars. It also, the dividing wall in the rear, also the other pillar that's missing, uh, also the, the, the dimensions of the building themselves. Also, the lines of the balconies, those little lines, those lines of the balcony on either side, they fit that well too. There's Joyce. Now, there's a lot more symbolism here as well because, um, because the placement of the vertical pillars and panel may be interpreted on the floor pan as outlining a T shape. And I'm talking about these see this pillar, this pillar, this pillar, and this one. Um, it's possible that uh, there, the, the, the the purpose of them is to outline a T-shape, okay? And this is from Jeff Bach. This is what Jeff Bach is suggesting. This T-shape, it's an upside down T, but it's still a T. Uh, Jeff Bach suggests that this T-shape may represent Burma's half cross T, the part of the skull that God removed from, from Adam along with his rib to create Eve. So uh, if you'll indulge me here, if you look at a transparency of a skull, and there's that half cross T right there, According to Burma, as Adam succumbed to the desire for a mate, God put him to sleep and took out of his rib, took out of the rib from his side, uh, took his rib out of his side, but also this half cross T from Adam's head to create woman. According to Burma, the half cross T symbolized the cross on which Christ would die, suffering for the sins of humanity beginning with Adam and sinful humanity. And according to Burma, the three points of the T-shape also represent the Holy Trinity. So there's all this symbolism in here. Now there's even a little bit more symbolism in this as I start to kind of wrap this up and I open up for questions. You, so you can see that the Star of David in a circle with an imposed equilateral cross is an important symbol for Welling. It unites Burmist, Kabbalistic, and alchemical symbols. The six points of the hexagram also represents the six days of work or creation with the center point of rest in the middle. So you've got the six different days, one, two, three, four, five, six, and the seventh day in the center right there, okay? And there's even more symbolism here because the other components of the hexagram with the cross create the symbols for the four elements and almost all the, and almost all the primary substances. So we've got the, uh, we've got fire right there, that triangle, straight up there. We've got earth, downward triangle, the line goes right across it. We've got air, another triangle up with another line across it right there. We've also got water, but we've also got a circle with a line going through it. Well, that's salt. And you finally got the one for sulfur. The only thing that's missing is mercury. You can't get mercury out. Now, the center point of the hexagram is also the equilateral cross and the actual center point of the Zoll. So, if you come into the Zoll today, there's a wall there, and there's the and there's the post there, and uh, it, it looks like this is the center point, but actually, it's not. It's not the center point of the Zoll because because of this wall right here. This is the actual center point of the wall. This is the actual center point. And there has been uh, some historians, not Jeff Bach, but another historian suggested that if Faisal was to preach celibacy in the Zoll to the householders, this would be the perfect place for them to stand. Now, having said all this, this historic speculation, I need to um, read a little disclaimer. Uh, there is a certain degree of historic speculation 
here. How well Beisel knew Welling's work, if at all, is unclear. They appear to share some of the same similar interests and beliefs. Von Welling's concept came from Burma, Christian Kabbalah, numerology, and alchemy, and these were bodies of knowledge familiar to many radical pietists and most likely some at Ephrata. So to sum things up, these are just possibilities. There are, these are just good educated guesses by Jeff Bach and others, and I'll, I'll own them too. Um, Jeff even concedes, Jeff Bach even concedes towards the end of the section on this book, and I quote, that Pennell's design may have derived simply from a circle with its diameter and a triangle imposed upon it, a fairly conventional pattern that would have allowed common people to construct large structures with simple measuring devices and without drawn plans. Whether or not intentional mystical symbols shape Pennell remains an open question. However, symbolic metaphors and shapes clearly existed in the literature that influenced Beisel and Ephrata and could have contributed corresponding design elements to Pennell. And those metaphors appear in the literature that Ephrata created. So whether it's all right or not, it's interesting speculation. It's a fascinating building. It's a fascinating story. And with that, I want to uh, thank you all for uh, indulging me with this time. And uh, if you've got any questions whatsoever, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth. And uh, thank you. Uh, and if you've got any questions, anyone, please let Elizabeth know. Or do you want to let her talk? Or you just want, or you want to just, whatever you want to do. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Thank you. You're muted. There we go. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Nick. Um, that was, I'm always amazed when you put the overlay on top of the, the, the all what, what happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's always kind of like, Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> a building we walk in every day and don't think too much about. And when you do that, it, it kind of makes me sit up and take notice, but we do have some questions. Good. Um, Peggy Hartzell wants to know if Conrad and Kelpius ever met. There's no, no, there's no, no, they did not ever meet. And, but Conrad Beisel, one of the reasons Conrad Beisel came to the new world, came to America, was that he knew about the Kelpius community, which was actually found, found by a man named Zimmerman. And uh, Kelpius takes it over after Zimmerman dies. Uh, but by the time Conrad Beisel got to America, uh, there was only a tiny remnant of the Kelpius group, and Kelpius was dead. But one of the reasons that, that Conrad Beisel was coming to America was to join this community or be part of it or learn something about it. But they were gone by the time he got here. They were just a tiny remnant, a tiny fragment. He knew about them though. Um, Jack Harley wants to know what, when did, when, I'm, he said, when was the book brought to Ephrata? So I'm guessing he means when was Sebastian Keller at Ephrata? Oh, that's, she's, uh, huh. well, he's, Sebastian Keller is at, okay, the book 1753. Um, he's at, he's, Keller is at, is at effort fairly early because he's a roommate with, uh, with Ezekiel Sangmeister. So I'm thinking 1750s or even earlier. Um, Michael would know that a lot better. He would know, Michael would know that a lot exactly those, get a better idea of those years. But 1750s, yeah. Michael, do you want to unmute yourself? We have some other of our staff here today. Easier if I unmute and try and type it in. Uh, Sangmeister was there from 48 to 52, so that's the time period he would have been roommate with uh, Keller. And I don't know the exact dates on Keller right off the top of my head, but 48 to 52, and you say the book is the, the copy of 53? 17, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it's right on the book. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but it may be 1735, I think, 1735. 30, 35, I think, is the date on the book. Yeah. Right, so that doesn't give you, that doesn't give you the answer when, he, when he's got it there. But yeah, yeah Sebastian Keller's there between those years. Um. We have Michael Weber wants to know, are there any insights on the effects of the geometry on the acoustical properties of the Sol? It's a good question. I don't really know. Uh, it's got beautiful acoustics, beautiful acoustics. Uh, you know, there just seems to be a speculation that there was some thought going into that. Uh, 
I don't know about those. I mean, we don't have the, we don't know about any blueprints. Or we don't know who built it specifically. We know a few of the builders at Ephrata. We don't know the specific builders of this all or the sister's house. Um, Jane, and I'm not even going to try with the, the last name there. Sorry, Jane. The geometry does not fit exactly into the plan. Is there an explanation for that? <laughs> and are there scribe marks? Scribe, just have to look at it again. Uh, I mean, it is possible. You know, it doesn't fit mathematically. You know? And also, I mean, the building's off. I mean, the building is off. And when the building was restored, I mean, it was falling, it was sliding down the hill. So I don't think it's complete. It's nearly completely square. And there's a lot of things that those buildings aren't square, they aren't completely square. So there may have been an effort uh, by yours truly to make those fit a little bit better. So it's not, you know, it's not completely, you know, it's not completely true. That's true geometry, you no, know, it doesn't fit completely. Um, Marion Chateau makes a reference to uh, Wisdom's Feast is a good reference. There is some evidence that the hymn to the Logos in the first chapter of John is based on an earlier hymn to Sophia. Oh, okay. More of an observation than, than a question. I, I, I have to look at that again, too. Yeah, yeah. No. Okay. And anybody else have any questions that they'd like to post? You just put it in the chat. Um, well, I'm giving you a minute to think. I do want to let you know that we will be having a program on August 1st. That's Saturday, August 1st uh, at 2 p. Yeah, 2 p.m. 2 in the afternoon Eastern Time. Uh, Michael Showalter will be discussing some of the householder families. We were planning to have sort of a householder homecoming householder family reunion, if you will, at the site this August, but because of the current situation with the pandemic, we have switched that to just a, an online um, sort of a, a informational piece as a preview for perhaps hopefully having this on site next year with a householder homecoming. Information about that can be found on our Facebook page. We will also be having another evening, another uh, Thursday evening on August 13th. So stay tuned um, to keep your eyes on our Facebook page to take a look at that when that becomes available to register for that. Oh, and Elizabeth, if anybody has any other questions or comments, please, if you disagree, please put them in, in, uh, in, on, on our Facebook page and uh, we, we'll, we'll answer them. Um, yeah, we love, love to. Uh, Indulge with people that agree, disagree, and have any questions. That's how we learn. You know, so, and if yeah. you think of something later and you want to write an email to us, just send it to the general email account at efforta1732 at gmail.com. And we'd be happy to, I'll be happy to forward that on to Nick and he'll get back to you on that. All right. Well, I'm not seeing anything else coming in. Okay. So I think we're about at uh, time. And thank everybody for joining us tonight. And uh, we look forward to seeing you back again next time. And thank you all. Good night. Visit us. Visit us when we're open again. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Oh, wait a minute. I got two new messages. What do we got here? Okay, just congratulations. Great thank job. You. So you can look at the chat too, Nick, and you can see these. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of the evening. Okay.